Welcome to the Muskoka Bible Center YouTube channel. We trust that this resource will be an encouragement to you as you grow in your faith. Bible teaching is at the core of what we do here at Muskoka Bible Center. So enjoy this sermon series. As I mentioned this morning, we're going to continue our study of Romans 8. And we're going to be looking at Romans 8, 31 through 39. So I invite you to open your copy of Scripture to Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 31. And once you open that, uh, follow along with me as I read God's Word. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, these truths are so precious to us, and they sound so high and lofty and magnificent. In the midst of our suffering, we want to believe them, but we find it hard at times. Father, by the ministry of your Spirit, would you impress upon us once more your love for us? Father, would you encourage your people? By the testimony of your Spirit, would you remind us that we are children of God, that we can cry out, Abba, Father? Father, through the ministry of your Word, would you show us the security that we have in Christ? Because you love us as you love your son. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Um, I don't know a lot about Canada or the culture or what's going on here uh, socially, politically, so on and so forth. But in the United States, uh, I would imagine there are some similarities. And what I mean is simply this, that there used to be a time in the United States where it was actually convenient to be called a Christian. It actually was convenient for people to join a church. Perhaps they were pursuing politics or they were opening a business or they were new in town and they wanted to meet people. And there was actual advantage to calling yourself a Christian and joining yourself to a local church. I don't know about Canada, but that's no longer the case in the United States. It is no longer an advantage to someone to be called a Christian or to identify themselves as a Christian. It, in fact, what we have been seeing in our context is an increased hostility from the world against Christians. This has been an increased hostility that's been growing. Now, for us, that may seem like it's new. It may feel like it's worse than any time in our lives. But throughout the history of Christianity, it is actually nothing new. And so Paul is writing to Romans, Roman Christians, who are at the seat of government. They're in the heart of the empire under an oppressive regime. And it is in this context that Paul writes to these Romans as to how to endure the sufferings of life and the persecutions of government and the persecutions of culture. And so as we come into this text, I want to ask us, how would you respond if you were to suffer simply because you identify as a Christian, simply because you call yourself a Christian, how would you respond when someone opposes you at school or at university simply because you're a Christian? How would you respond if someone accuses you of hypocrisy or bigotry just because you're a Christian? How would you respond when you lose rights or social privileges just because you're a Christian? How would you respond when you face disappointment and hardship because you actually do things the right way, but you're punished for it because you're a Christian? 
And maybe you've read stories or, or heard news accounts. Maybe you yourself have, have experienced some of this kind of discrimination or this kind of persecution. How do you respond? Are we going to act out in anger? Are we going to seek revenge? Sometimes we can become confused in the midst of our suffering and we can try to place blame in different places. Do we think in our minds that maybe this has happened to me because God is punishing me? Maybe I've done something wrong. Or do you question whether God still loves you? Do you wonder in the midst of your suffering, God, do you really love me anymore? Because this is what I'm facing. Do you question the assurance of your salvation? Th these are all possible responses to Christian suffering. Because suffering is a part of the Christian life we need to prepare for. The question is not if we will suffer. It's when we will suffer. And how will we respond when we face it? And this is what Paul is doing here. He's preparing the Roman Christians to face suffering in faith and to not lose heart. Uh, this morning, I preached from Romans 8, 18 through 30. There, Paul reminds us that God uses our suffering for our good. God doesn't waste any suffering. God is using everything, all things. That phrase, all things, becomes an important part of the argument in Romans chapter 8. So, so keep in mind for the all things as we work through this text. God is using all things to conform us to the image of his son. And he is using absolutely everything. And he has been working from all of history to bring you to himself. And he is using every circumstance, situation, experience, good and bad, to bring you to himself in glory until we share in the hope of the glory of God. And now we come to Romans 8, verses 31 through 39, and this is the, the climax of Paul's argument to this point. And I take this to be particularly focused on Christian suffering. And the reason I take it to be focused on Christian suffering, as we'll see, is verse 36. In verse 36, Paul quotes a psalm that points to Israel's suffering because they identify with Yahweh, their God. And here's what I want us to consider as we work through this text. Because God loves us, we can make it personally. Because God loves you, no enemy will ultimately prevail against you. I just let that sink in for a moment. It feels like the world is against us, doesn't it? It feels like maybe our neighbors are against us. It, it just feels like, you know, in the workplace, it just feels like the world is against us. Paul is encouraging us in that context Nothing will ultimately prevail against us. And what I mean by ultimately is in the end, in the end, our enemies cannot prevail against us. And this is what Paul wants us to understand. We may face different defeats. We may face suffering and we will face suffering. But in the end, no one, nothing will prevail against us. In Romans 8, 31 through 39, Paul equips us to face Christian suffering with confidence Let's look at this in a number of ways. Paul has helpfully structured this text for us in questions. Uh, Paul is so helpful here because he's raising the very questions that we would ask in this context. In verse 31, he says, what then shall we say to these things? These things refers not only to Romans 8, 28 through 30, the all things, but it refers at least back to chapter 5. And this is a climax of Paul's argument, I think, from chapter 5 to this point. No matter what we face, we are secure in God's love. Remember chapter 5 where Paul says God demonstrates his Lord love toward us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So from Romans chapter 5 to Romans chapter 8, Paul is really hammering to us God's love for us. In Romans 8, 18 through 30, I was trying to show us how Paul was hammering for us. God's love for us reaches in eternity past and is for loving us, for knowledge and predestination and election and his effectual calling. God's love is, is for us from eternity past. And now Paul is helping us understand how to apply this love to our lives. Now, what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And here in verses 31 and 32, what I want us to see is this. 
If you're taking notes, this is the first point. No one can ultimately prevail against us. No one can ultimately prevail against us. Here's the question in verse 31. If God is for us, again, Paul's been arguing that from chapter 5. How do we know God is for us? When we hated him, when we rejected him, when we were sinners, he sent his own son to take on his wrath for our sin, and he demonstrated his love for us. If that God is for us, who can be against us? Who do you think can actually come against us? What kind of opposition did the early church face? Well, in Matthew 10, 17 through 18, Paul, uh, uh, Jesus reminds uh, his audience, beware of men for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake. I alluded to, Rome, uh, to Revelation 2 and 3. There, the Jews, in some contexts, were turning over Christians to the governing officials because the Christians, the first Christians, came out of a Jewish background, and they were turning the Christians over to the governing officials. This is the kind of opposition that the Christians faced very early on. And again, the Roman Christians were in the heart of the empire, in the seat of government. What kind of opposition should we expect? Now, I don't think that we're in the revelation kind of, of persecution where in our context here in the West, where we're being in prison and, and sentenced to death, some believers are experiencing that in the Middle East and in other parts of the world, but, but we're not facing that. I think much of what we're facing is the kind of opposition of First Peter. We'll talk about First Peter on Wednesday morning, Lord willing. But in First Peter, Paul is writing to Christians in Asia Minor who are facing social discrimination. They're facing discrimination and persecution in the home. Perhaps a believing wife from an unbelieving husband. Perhaps a bond servant from their master. The loss of social privileges and social rights. These are the kinds of experiences that the early Christians were facing to whom Peter was writing in Asia Minor. It seems to me that these are the kinds of discriminations and persecutions we're facing here in the West. A few years ago, um, a sociologist named George Yancey, who is a sociologist at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, he sent a survey of open-ended questions to progressive activists concerning their thoughts about Christians. And I take this to be in the United States. Here are some of the responses of progressive activists as they respond to questions about Christians, about people like you and me. The progressive activists in the survey said, kill them all, God will sort them out. A torturous death would be too good for them. I'd be a bit giddy, certainly grateful, if everyone who saw himself or herself in that category, Christian, were snatched permanently from our societal peripheries, whether by holocaust or rapture or plague. I am only too well aware of their horrific attitudes and beliefs, and those are enough to make me see them as subhuman. Now, this is a sociologist at a major university just asking progressive activists, and this is how they feel about Christians. This is what they actually articulated on a survey. Dr. Yancey also found discrimination against Christians in universities. Quote, the academics answering my survey, he says, explicitly stated they would discriminate against a job candidate who is a conservative Protestant. Again, this is just the cultural ethos in which we live, in which we exist, in which we have to, uh, to live as Christians. We also hear of news accounts of business owners being discriminated against or boycotted because of their Christian convictions. And again, we, we may not be facing beheadings or being thrown to lions, but the world has always hated Christians because they hate Christ. Jesus told his disciples in John 15, look, if the world hates you, know that the world hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you because the world loves its own. But the world hates you because I chose you 
out of the world. Now, what I don't want to do is scare us, and what I don't want to do is get us in a posture where we think, oh my goodness, we're in danger. Look at all those hateful people out there. I don't want us to ever lose sight of the fact that those people out there that are calling us names and want us dead are our mission field. And Jesus said we're to love our enemies. What I'm trying to do is help us understand in this cultural context, how are we to respond to this kind of hatred? Paul answers in verse 31. He says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? This is where I'm getting this point. If God is for us, no one can ultimately prevail against us. This God, this God who who has moved heaven and earth and has worked throughout history in providence to bring us to himself, to display his love for us in Christ. If that God is for us, this God who is ultimately sovereign, no one, no one can prevail against us. Again, I don't mean that in every circumstance that we'll prevail and be victorious. But what Paul means, I think, is that While suffering is real and it happens, as one commentator says, absolutely nothing will be able to frustrate the good intentions of God for those whom he loves. Let me just say that again because it's really important. Absolutely nothing will be able to frustrate the good intentions of God for those whom he loves. And again, that idea comes directly from Romans 8.28. I remember when I first started traveling to Cuba. It's a place where there's really a lot of, of oppression and a lot of discrimination against Christians. It's not overt because they're kind of playing a political game. They want to show the world that there's religious freedom up front, but under the scenes, they're trying to undermine Christianity. And one of the fascinating things that I learned is no matter what the government does to try to suppress the church, actually God uses to grow the church. So the government says, no more church buildings. So guess what happens? A house church movement grows, and it spreads throughout the entire island. If God is for us, who can be against us? Even the evil that is meant against us, God uses for our good to conform us to the image of his son, and he uses it to advance his gospel and to make his son famous. Nothing the world does can prevail against his plans and his purposes for his people. Enemies may oppose you, but they will not ultimately prevail. Why? Well, the proof is in verse 32. Look at the proof that Paul puts forth. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? There's that all things again. God is working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And this God who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? There is nothing excluded from all things. What are the all things that God will give us? Again, all things should not be cut off here from the all things of verse 28 or in all these things of verse 37. What is it that God has given us? Well, he's given us his son, right? Isn't that enough? (laughs) He's given us his son, but Paul goes on. And if he has not withheld his own son, will he not give us everything that we need for life and for godliness and for perseverance, even in the midst of difficulties? He's given us his son. He's given us his word. Throughout history, men wrote down the word of God that was meant to be for us. And the Holy Spirit superintended the writing of God's revelation so that we could have a Bible, so that we could know who God is, what he is like, and what he requires of us. He's given us his spirit. One of the tremendous promises of the new covenant Not only will we have a new heart, which he's given us, but we have his spirit. God dwells in us by his spirit. And not only do we have his son, his spirit, his word, we have each other. He's given us the church. The church is an amazing institution of God. 
In Ephesians 3.10, Paul says that it is through the church that God displays his manifold wisdom to the cosmic powers. As Jew and Gentile function together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a diverse people come together and live together as brothers and sisters in the church, we are literally displaying to heaven and hell that our God is wise in exalting Jesus Christ as King and Lord over all things and placing everything under the authority of Christ and uniting all things that have been fractured by sin in Christ. The existence of the church is proof against Satan that our God has won. And that he is wise. And beloved, we cannot undermine the church. We live in a world, especially after COVID, where people love Jesus, but they don't love the church. And the church is where we do life together. The church is where we fulfill all the one another's in scripture. The church is a gift from the Lord Jesus Christ for us to endure. The church is where disciples are made. The church is where we grow, we hear the word, and we speak that word in truth, in love to one another. These are the things that God has given us and and much, much more. Everything that we receive that is good is from God and is a part of the all things that he's given us. But part of the all things that God has given us includes suffering. Again, all things, we can't, we can't choose what is in the all things. God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But God has also given us all things, and that all things includes suffering, the suffering by which he strengthens our faith. I know we don't like to say it or admit it, but one of the means that God is causing us to endure to the end is suffering. God uses suffering in our lives to conform us to the image of his son and to actually make us stronger Christians, to make us more like his son, Jesus. And since God is for us, how can we respond confidently in the face of opposition? Here's just a few ways. Number one, remember God's sovereign providential care. Whatever you're facing, Remember God's sovereign providential care. He's working all things for your good. So don't be surprised by suffering, says Peter. Remember the story of Joseph. Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers. Joseph understood that what his brothers meant for evil, God meant for good. The same evil that his brothers meant for his destruction, that same evil God meant for good, to save the world, literally, and to save Israel, the nation that he was creating. Through that one evil of being sold into slavery. And again, we see this throughout, don't we? I remember... When I was uh, young, uh, my parents couldn't afford university, and so at 17, I enlisted in the United States Navy, and I went into the Navy, and after being in the Navy for a year, I won a scholarship to the University of Florida, and I was a midshipman there, but during that time, I was sensing the Lord was calling me into ministry, and in order to pursue that, I had relinquished my scholarship, and I remember having an argument with my lieutenant. And I told him I was going to relinquish my scholarship and I was going to go back and finish my enlistment. He said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. He said, no, you're not. He said, yes, I am. He said, no, you're not. And then finally I said, yes, I am. And then he said, I'm going to send you to the worship in the Navy. And he did. He sent me to the USS Detroit. It was an oiler. And what we did is we would go out in the middle of the ocean and we would replenish ships so that they wouldn't have to come into port. We carried everything from fuel to ice cream to nuclear weapons. And so I had no rating, no job, and so I went to the deck department. And the very first week, I put on a harness, and I was hanging over the side of this ship painting haze gray. He sent me to the worship in the Navy, and I had the worst job in the Navy. I literally was no one. The chaplain interviewed me, and within just a matter of a few days... I went from being the lowest man on the totem pole, having nothing to my name or credit, to being the only enlisted man with his own private office and a crew of 500. Now, I I didn't do that. 
I didn't do that. But to me, it's an example of what one person meant for evil, God meant for good. And God is always working, even the evil that some people intend for us and against us, God is using and he's weaving for his glory, for our good, in order that his purposes would continue to be advanced. So remember God's sovereign providential care. Because God is for you, no one can frustrate God's purposes. No one can frustrate God's plan. And no one can ultimately prevail against you. Secondly, though, meditate on God's extravagant love for you on the cross of Christ. Whenever you suffer, you'll be tempted to question God's goodness, God's sovereignty, God's love for you. And when you're facing that difficulty, meditate on God's love for you in the cross of his son. As it says here in verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God loved you from eternity past and worked all things to save you in Christ while you were still a sinner, won't he continue to be for you even when you can't see it or can't understand it? Thirdly, pray for those who come against you. Pray for those who come against you, for those in authority, for unbelievers, for professors that are antagonistic, for neighbors that are hostile. You see, they need Christ. You and I at one time were hostile to God, engaged in evil deeds. You and I were destined for hell, very deservedly so. But God saved us. It is only by God's grace and mercy that you're sitting here in this room this evening and not out in the world living your life against God and against his people. So pray for those who come against you. They need Christ. Consider the testimony of the Apostle Paul who was persecuting Christians. One of the most precious passages I remember in the book of Acts is when they were about to stone Stephen, and it says there that everyone brought their coats and placed them at the feet of a man named Saul. And as Stephen is being pelted with stones, (laughs) he's being pelted with stones. He says, Father, do not hold this against them, which to me echoes the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And I often wonder if one of the ways that God answered Stephen's prayer was by saving Saul of Tarsus, who became one amazing apostle. You see, I don't know what it is that we think, but this hostile world that's against us is our mission field. They really are against us, and we really do suffer, but God really can't save And so let's pray for those who persecute us. Let's love them with the love of Christ. When they revile us, let us not revile in return. But let us, number four, entrust ourselves to the God who judges justly. Listen, I'm not talking about pie in the sky by and by. I understand this is really hard. And I will grant you that I've not suffered like some Christians throughout the world have suffered. But Peter records for us the response of our Lord Jesus Christ when he suffered. He did not revile those who reviled against him. He was in an unfair trial. He didn't complain. He didn't demand his rights. He entrusted himself to the God who judges justly. And when we understand that this sovereign God who is for us and that no one can ultimately prevail against us, when we understand this God will do right, we can entrust those who hate us to his judgment. And we have to leave them to God and understand that God's judgment will be enacted and all rights will be wronged. And it's possible that the very people who hate us, their justice may also come at the cross of Christ if they turn to faith in Jesus. And God deals with their injustices in his son. But if they continue to reject Christ and continue to hate his people, there is a day of reckoning coming. And the God who judges justly will do right. 
And when we entrust ourselves to him, it delivers us from trying to exact vengeance. It delivers us from hatred and from bitterness that grows in our hearts. And it allows us to respond the way that our Lord Jesus responded. And then number five, we respond in faith. Endure in faith, knowing that God is for you because he loves you. The opposition is real. The opposition is hard. But because God is for us, those who oppose us will not prevail against us. And this is how Paul is helping us get through this day. But there's also the question of our mind in the last day, the day of final judgment. And so Paul raises this question. He says in verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? So in the final day, what will people say against us? Will someone raise up on that last day and say, hey, I know Juan. I knew Juan when he was a kid. I know everything that Juan did, and here's what I have against him. Or really, the way the Bible describes it is Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he will bring all kinds of charges against us. And so the question, who shall bring a charge against God's chosen ones, is a real question for us. This is legal court language. It is also future, which is, um, which is why I'm looking at the, line, the final day. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Of course, there's a reality of present condemnation. People bring all kinds of accusations against Christians. So, so this applies both to the accusations people bring against Christians today, but any accusations the enemy will bring on the last day. And the answer, Paul says, is no one. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is of the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Here's more proof that God is for you. The proof of the first question is that God did not withhold his son. The proof of the second question, who will bring a charge against God's elect, is the fact that Jesus died, rose again, is exalted at the right hand of the Father, and he is interceding for you. And just think about that. We tend to think of this more in prayer language, but think of this more of a court judicial setting. Anyone brings a charge against you, Jesus Christ is your advocate. He is your defense attorney. He is the one who intercedes for you. And on the final day, when you stand before God on that day of judgment, and anyone, Satan, anyone brings a charge against you, it is Jesus who we will speak on your behalf. Isn't that glorious? If God is for us, who is to condemn us? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? The answer is no one. No accusation will stand against us on judgment day. This is what we need to understand. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised and who is interceding for you. More proof that God is for you that Jesus is his God's right hand. The Bible says it is appointed for man to die once and then comes judgment. This means that we should not be afraid of final judgment because Jesus is our advocate. So if you're here tonight and, and you wonder what that day will be like, take heart. God is for you. No one can bring a charge against you. Jesus is interceding for you now before the Father, and he will intercede for you on that final day. Because God is for us, no one can be against us. Now, how should we respond to Satan's accusations even now? Well, consider God's acceptance of you in Christ. Look back on your justification. Remember Romans 8. 29, God is the one who justified us. He's the one who declared us righteous, not because of any merit of our own, but because we have trusted in Christ. And when we put our faith in Christ, God took the righteousness of Jesus Christ and accounted it to us, put it in our account. He took our sin and put it in Jesus' account. And Jesus has dealt with that on the cross. So we stand before God as righteous counted righteous. I grew up Roman Catholic 
And one of the things that I remember being taught is if I came upon an accident scene that I had to try to immediately baptize that person in any kind of liquid whatsoever, even if it was their own blood. Because in the Roman Catholic system, baptism washes away original sin. It brings your account to zero. But then after that, you have to try to keep your account above zero. Friends, that's not good news. The gospel is the good news that Jesus, by his death, has brought our account to zero by paying for our sin. But then God has applied Jesus' righteousness to our account. So our account is way, 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 way up above zero. There's nothing that will separate us from God's love for us. He's declared us righteous. There's no one who can condemn us. God knows you best. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he has still accepted you in his son, Jesus Christ. He already knows the worst about you. And he still loves you and has accepted you in Christ. Secondly, consider God's work to make you holy. God has not only brought your account to zero and not only accounted the righteousness of Christ, but God is now at work by his spirit and his word and his church to conform you to the image of his son and to make you righteous, to make you holy. And Paul says to the Philippians that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. The God who saved you is at work right now to make you like his son and can conform you to his image. But thirdly, confess your sin. You see, when we understand the truth about justification and the truth about God's love for us, it actually frees us to confess our sins. It it frees us to confess our sins before God. It frees us to confess our sins before one another. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 32 because it reminds me of the grace of God and the forgiveness of sins. David talks about keeping his sin hidden. You know what that's like, don't you? You've sinned and you don't want anyone to know and you try to cover it up. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden when they sinned. They found some fig leaves and tried to cover themselves up. Isn't that what we all do? We try to cover up our sin. Psalm 32 reminds us that so long as we try to cover up our sin, we'll be miserable. The way that David explains it is like God's hand was heavy upon him, like the fever heat of summer. I like to think like the fever heat of a Texas summer. God makes us miserable. The psalmist talks about not being able to sleep because he's crying all day and all night, not being able to eat because he's miserable in the covering up of his sin. But it has this beautiful picture that when he uncovered his sin, there was great freedom and forgiveness, and he was able to teach transgressors of the ways of God. You know, (laughs) when we uncover our sin, you know what God does for us? He does the very thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to cover up our sin. But when we uncover our sin, God covers our sin in the blood of his son. And when we know of God's love for us, when we know that no accusation will stand against us, it actually frees us to confess our sins. Can you imagine how much stronger our marriages would be if we believe this truth? if we were able to freely confess our sins before our wife or before our husband, if we were able to freely confess our sins before our children, knowing that in the end, no one can condemn us. No one can bring any accusations against us. Can you imagine the impact on a local church in which the culture of the local church were people very quick to confess sin and very quick to grant forgiveness of sin? Can you imagine the culture of a church where there's that kind of honesty and openness to know, no matter what I admit to, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a glorious church it would be where it is safe to confess sin because you know that no one can condemn you, but because you know you're forgiven and you will forgive one another. So... Confess your sins before the Lord and to one another. You don't have to be afraid of final judgment because God is for you. No one, not even Satan, can condemn you on the last day. He cannot even condemn you now because God has justified you in Christ. But of course, 
Some people face such hard suffering or so much suffering in a short period of time that they're tempted to doubt God's love for them. And so this is the third point and final point that I would bring from verses 35 to 39. No one or nothing can separate us from God's love. No one or nothing can separate us from God's love. Again, Paul helpfully asks a question in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he has this long list of things. He offers in verse 35 some examples that reflect afflictions that he's faced in his own life and ministry. Look at 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. These kind of parallel some of the afflictions that Paul himself faced in his life and ministry. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? This is a rhetorical question, and we know that the answer is no. None of these things shall separate us from the love of Christ. And he offers an example from the life of Israel from Psalm 44, verse 22, where in Psalm 44, God's righteous people are suffering innocently, and they're suffering for the sake of God. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. God's righteous people in this moment in history, in Psalm 44, are recorded to be suffering simply because they identify with their God. That's the reason they're suffering. And Paul quotes this psalm to say, look, we suffer too because we align ourselves with Christ. And so when we suffer, we might be tempted to question God's love for us. I don't know if you've ever been there. If you've ever wondered as you're suffering, God, what, what is happening? Why am I going through this? Are you really in control? Have you, have you lost it? Or God, do you really love me? And this is where Paul is trying to help us think through these things rightly. It's okay to ask questions of God. Just read the lament Psalms where complaints are brought before God. Listen, our God is sovereign our questions are not going to tumble him from his throne. <laughs> but we know this God is good and he is for us. How? Because he has loved us in Christ. We can be confident of his love for us in the face of suffering. Look at verses 37 through 39. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, rulers here I take to be principalities or powers, the demonic realm, neither angels nor demons, nor height nor depth, and if we leave anything out, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This love that God uh, has displayed for us in Christ that Paul described in Romans 8, 29 and 30 that has been set upon us from eternity past. In the Son, no one can separate us from this love. He loved us in Christ from eternity past. He has loved us in Christ in history. He is loving us in Christ now, using all things to make us look like his Son. This is what Paul says, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul knew that God shows his strength through our weaknesses, and he welcomed that. And Paul also knew that God's grace is sufficient to carry us through. Here we have the security of the believer. Here we have the assurance of faith the God who loved us from eternity past will in no way cast us out. Nothing in the entire universe, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love he has cast upon us from eternity past in his son, Jesus Christ. This love that he showed in history on the cross, this love that he showed in our life in a moment when he called us to himself and he justified us. Nothing will separate us from this love, and he will ultimately glorify us and bring us to himself. So, how do we cultivate confidence in God's love? Number one, don't trust your feelings. 
Don't trust your feelings. Your feelings can deceive you, especially when things are going poorly. Don't trust your feelings. Don't trust your circumstances. Don't assume that because you're suffering that somehow God is punishing you or God is against you or God has stopped loving you. Instead, trust Trust in his word for you. He has told us he is working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Read the scriptures. See the love of God for you from all eternity and throughout history. And trust in his work for you. Trust in his past grace. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Trust in his work for you and his work in you. The fruit that he's producing in your life for his glory. The good works that he is causing you to produce. And trust in the testimony of the Spirit in you, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. I'm not sure what you're facing right now. But the question is, how will you respond? God has loved you from eternity past. God has worked all things in your life to bring you to himself. God has worked all things in your life to bring you to this moment. God is working all things in your life to endure your faith and glorify you on the last day. What will you say to these things? If God is for you, who can be against you? The answer is no one and nothing. If there's one thing that we may have confidence in, it is God's love for us in Christ. And if he has not withheld his son, he will not withhold anything that we need to endure faithfully until the end. In all these things, in all these things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the hard, the evil, the glorious, the beautiful, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness to us in Christ and for the promises that we have in your scriptures. That you are for us, and because you are for us, no one can come against us. No one can condemn us. No one or nothing can separate us from the love that you have established for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so, Father, no matter what we face, help us to face it with confidence in you. Help us not to be discouraged. Father, protect us from bitterness and anger. And Father, help us to love those who hate us and to pray for them and for their salvation. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. I trust this sermon was an encouragement to you. We have various other resources available as well, including activities and retreats throughout the year that are designed to focus on growing, resilient, biblically rooted families. Check out our website at muskokabible.com.